who is situated, sorry, uh, uh, that the University of Waterloo is situated on land that is the traditional home of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral people. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions Indigenous peoples have made in shaping and strengthening this community. We are grateful for the opportunity to meet here and reaffirm our collective commitment to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our community. I would also like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places near and far and acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. Hello everyone, my name is Troy Glover, uh, Chair of the Department of Recreation and Leisure Studies at the University of Waterloo. I am delighted to welcome you to the Faculty of Health's Hallman Lecture Series. Today we are delighted to host the 2021 recipient of the Shaw Mannell Leisure Research Award Dr. Lucy Thibault. Thank you for attending. Thanks. The, de the Department of Recreation and Leisure Studies aims to lead through its critical examination of leisure, broadly defined, and its relationship to individual and community well being. Our vision is to advance well being through leisure to create a just and healthy world. We do so through four strategic pillars excellence through high impact teaching practices and meaningful student experience, relevant research, a flourishing culture and thriving team, and community engagement and partnerships. These strategic pillars are embodied in today's celebration. Today, we honor a very special colleague for her outstanding contributions to leisure scholarship. Dr. Lucy Thibault from the University of Ottawa, our 2021 recipient of the Shaw Mannell Leisure Research Award. Established in 20, 2010, the Shaw Mannell Leisure Research Award commemorates the outstanding contributions of two University of Waterloo faculty members, Drs. Susan Shaw and Roger Mannell, by recognizing outstanding individual career research achievements that have influenced leisure scholarship at the University of Waterloo. We are delighted Roger is in attendance today and invite him to offer a brief hello to everyone. I saw him earlier. Maybe he could chime in later. How about that? Nominees for the Shaw Man Allegiance. Sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I am here. I was uh, I was muted. So uh, anyway, I, it's uh, it's great to participate in another one of these. And uh, congratulations to the award holder, though. Of course, she is now saddled with the distinction, at least of my name being attached to her resume and, and CV. But I look very much forward to uh, hearing her presentation and the discussion today. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, it's, it's fantastic that you're here with us today, Roger. Um, and we are delighted to have and honored to have a, an award that is co-named after you and Sue Shaw. Um, nominees for the Shaw Mannell Leisure Research Award are put forward by members of the Department of Recreation and Leisure Studies and must embody one or more of the attributes characteristic of the University of Waterloo. Specifically, their research must be innovative, creative, collaborative, courageous, risky, critical, unconventional, and or connected. In our view as a group of faculty, these descriptors characterize Dr. Thibault. In addition, nominees are also considered for their career contributions to the study of leisure. Oops, um, um, sorry. Their influence on leisure scholarship at the University of Waterloo and their international contributions to leisure studies. I will leave, leave it to my colleague, Dr. Ryan Snellgrove to provide a more fulsome description of the achievements of Dr. Thibault when he introduces our esteemed speaker. Before he does so, I am delighted to introduce the Dean of the Faculty of Health at the University of Waterloo, Dr. Lily Liu, to offer some introductory remarks and recognize the Hallman Fund for its generous support for today's lecture. Dr. Liu. Thank you so much, Troy. It's uh, wonderful um, to welcome all of you today on behalf of the Faculty of Health and a special welcome to our uh, award recipient and um, guest speaker today. Um, 
Dr. Uh, Thibault is, uh, is receiving the Shaw Mano uh, Leisure Research Award today. And uh, as you heard, Professor Ryan Snellgrove will share more about uh, her accomplishments uh, a little bit later. Right now, I'd like to provide some background about the Hallman Lecture Series. This series stems from the legacy of Lyle Hallman, a generous and local philanthropist and donor who was very interested in community and health. Not only was he well known in the local community, he was recognized for his good work through many awards and distinctions, including an honorary doctorate from the University of Waterloo, as well as the Order of Canada. After he passed away in 2003, the generous donations made by Lyle and his wife, Wendy, allowed our faculty to create endowments to expand and sustain health promotion activities. This funding has had significant impact on our community's health and well being through research activities and spread of knowledge related to health promotion and through events such as today's lecture. We here at the Faculty of Health are pleased to acknowledge and show our gratitude to them for their vision and support. Through these lectures, we demonstrate the faculty's commitment to prom promoting health and well being in our community in a very tangible way. I invite everyone to enjoy this lecture and award ceremony, and I now call on Professor Snellgrove to introduce our very special speaker. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to see so many familiar faces and, and uh, colleagues and, and friends. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lucy Thibault to everyone today. Dr. Thibault, or Lucy T, as she's affectionately known, is the current Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Ottawa. Previously, Dr. Thibault was a professor of sport management from 1994 to 2002 at UBC, and most recently from 2002 to 2018 at Brock University. She's also been a visiting scholar at a number of institutions around the world. Broadly, Dr. Thibault's research focuses on sport policy and organizational theory, primarily within the context of the Canadian amateur sport system. Academic articles have appeared in leading journals in the field, as you might expect, and her ideas have often been the foundation of subsequent work by a host of scholars seeking to understand ways of optimizing the operation and impact of amateur sport organizations and the sports system in general. Dr. Thibault's research has been supported by six SHRC grants, as well as several other external grants, which total uh, in excess of $575,000. Importantly, Dr. Thibault's research also extends beyond contributions to the academic literature. For example, she's translated her work through reports and presentations and collaborations with organizations like Sport Canada, Athletes Canada, and Row Ontario, to name just a few. And Dr. Thibault has generously shared her knowledge with scholars and students around the world through numerous speaking and educational engagements. On the strength of her, of her research, a record and contributions to the Academy, which notably included an editorship of the Journal of Sport Management, Dr. Thibault received the Earl F. Ziegler Award from the North American Society for Sport Management in 2008. This recognition is the highest honor given in the field of sport management and one that was richly deserved. Her bold talk, which I was lucky enough to see as a first year PhD student, was titled Globalization of Sport, an Inconvenient Truth. This talk represented a way of calling in sport management scholars who had largely ignored this important social issue. All of Dr. Thibault's research accomplishments are particularly impressive when you fully appreciate the amount of dedicated leadership she has provided to the universities in which she has worked and the, acad uh, and the academy at large. But not everything that counts can be counted. And that brings me to what I consider the most impressive and impactful part about Dr. Thibault something that cannot be found on her CV. And that is her informal mentorship of so many of us. Her extensive service work I alluded to before is just a small window into her unselfishness that has helped a lot of us develop as scholars. The encouragement, the thoughtful and kind critique of ideas and her inclusive approach has not gone unnoticed or unappreciated. So when I saw the title of Dr. Thibault's talk, It Takes a Village, mentorship in health, sport, and leisure studies, a thought that I absolutely want to hear about mentorship from Lucy T. So thank you, Dr. Thibault, for being here today and sharing your wisdom with us. We all look forward to your talk. 
Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Troy, and thanks, Lily. Um, I'll just ask if JT could put up my slides. Perfect. Merci. I'd, I'd like to start my lecture by acknowledging the land that I work and live on. Um, I'm on the Anishinaabe Algonquin territory that remains unceded. I also wanted to thank the University of Waterloo and the Department of Recreation and Leisure Studies for the Shaw Manor Leisure Research Award. To be associated with professors Susan Shaw and Roger Manor is an absolute honor. Each had illustrious careers and made immeasurable contributions to the fields of leisure studies, sociology, psychology, gender equity, social justice, and aging. They were mentors to so many scholars and students, undergraduate and graduates alike. I'm truly honored to be connected to these two seasoned and highly respected scholars. They have inspired so many professors, teachers, researchers, scholars, and students throughout their career and beyond. As well, I recognize the numerous recipients of this award and the role they have played as mentors, colleagues, and friends to so many of us. I note particularly the presence of my friend, Wendy Frisbee, who's in the virtual audience this afternoon. Thanks, Wendy. And I'd like to thank my colleague, Justin Thibault, who is managing my slides during this presentation. Merci, JT. My choice of topic for today's presentation, mentorship, came to me out of a few circumstances. The first one, I had a recent conversation with a former graduate student from my previous university last September. He told me that when he's been applying for faculty positions and when he's asked for referees, he explains how he describes his referees to the chair of the selection committee. That this reference was a faculty member he had to aid for, this other reference was his doctoral thesis supervisor, and I was his former master's supervisor and mentor. He emphasized mentor. The statement surprised me as I didn't know he considered me as a mentor. And how could I be a mentor without knowing it? I thought mentorship involved a two-way relationship. The second circumstance for the mentorship topic originates from my current position. In my work, I'm exposed to many students at different stages of their education path. These students are connected to programs in five different schools, including interdisciplinary health sciences, human kinetics, nursing, nutrition, and rehabilitation sciences. This is my shameless and only plug for the University of Ottawa's Faculty of Health Sciences. I interact regularly with many student leaders who are actively involved in their student government associations. I see how students act interact and react in faculty meetings, particularly graduate students who are more extensively engaged and more vocal in our faculty council meetings, maybe even more so during the pandemic. I've been surprised by the fact that the students' behaviors often appear to match how their supervisors interact and react. It's definitely not a scientific study, but it led me to a few observations. There seems to be a high correlation between the way faculty members act and interact and the way their students act and interact with others. In other word, or words, our students may be mimicking our behaviors, our ways of doing, and in some rare instances, even our sense of entitlement, even if it's not always positive. Some of us may be raising our students the way we were raised as graduate students. Therefore, how we train our students and may make a difference in how they will interact with others and train others in the future. Another observation is that one never really knows the short-term and long-term impacts we have on students, partly because they don't always come out and tell us, and partly because we interact with so many students in our work and we may not always know who we mentor and who considers us to be mentor. Now let's talk about the village in my title. We all know it takes a village for a whole lot of things in life, from raising children to caring for vulnerable and marginalized populations, 
from building communities to treating patients in an interprofessional context, to name a few. Now, I'm not the one who came up with the expression, it takes a village in connection with mentorship. I thought I was, but it turns out I wasn't even close. In fact, several scholars have written about mentorship in multiple contexts, whether it be education, human resources, career development, youth development, and more than a few of these authors have used the tagline, it takes a village. Uh, Clark is an example, Lambda et al, Les Gold, Spencer et al. Porter de Leon is another author who makes the connection between mentorship and the village. He claims that to get what you need, you have to look at your whole community, since it's, a, it's rare to find a single person who has all the necessary knowledge, time, and attention you need. You have to seek these things from multiple people in various positions inside and outside of your organization. Most people fall into the trap of expecting their supervisor to be their default mentor, providing them with everything they need so they never look for these things anywhere else. These lofty expectations inevitably lead to deep disappointment. The simple fact is most people are never trained to be mentors and are therefore woefully unprepared for the responsibilities of mentorship because they themselves never had a good example to follow." End of quotation. Mentoring is defined as a reciprocal and collaborative learning relationship between two or more individuals who share a mutual responsibility and accountability for helping a mentee work towards achievement of clear and mutually defined learning goals, a definition by Zachary. Parslo et al. define mentoring as the activity to support and encourage people to manage their own learning in order that they may maximize their potential, develop their skills, improve their performance, and become the person they want to be. Here are some keywords associated with mentorship, a diagram from the Professional Golfers Association of Alberta, but these keywords are consistently identified with mentorship in multiple contexts. Words support, goal, training, motivation, advice, success, direction, and coaching. Mentoring is often identified as a critical component in the success of trainees throughout their development. Recent graduates and new faculty members have acknowledged the need for and the value of mentorship as they start their career and or assume increasingly challenging leadership roles in different settings. Mentorship is an essential ele element for professional growth. As Porter de Leon explains, finding a good mentor is hard, but he argues that when one finds the perfect mentor, it could be transformative. According to Porter de Leon, the perfect mentor will have a sense of stewardship when helping mentees along the path to ultimate success within an organization and in a chosen career. More importantly, this person needs to care about the mentee and their future and have the energy, time, and authority to contribute to the mentee's growth as well as to, the, as well as to affect the organizational changes needed to enable that growth. Obviously, that's a lot to expect from a single person, which is why good mentors are so hard to find and why it may take a village to mentor our trainees. Now, here are some statistics about mentorship that were assembled by Cronin in 2020. 71% of the Fortune 500 companies have mentorship programs. 97% of those who had a mentor reported them as valuable. 89% who were mentored go on to mentor others. Mentees are promoted five times more than those without mentors. Mentors are six times more likely to be promoted. It kind of looks like mentors have an advantage over mentees in, that, uh, in those two last um, statistics. 87% of mentors and mentees report an increased sense of empowerment by their mentoring relationship and describe enhanced levels of confidence. 
and 79% of millennials report that mentoring is critical to their career success. These data clearly demonstrate that mentorship is valued for individuals, mentees and mentors alike, as well as for organizations. As noted by Zachary, mentoring is an organizational practice whose time has come. The need for continuous learning in organizations has never been greater. She explains that mentoring is a wise strategy for organizations as it allows them to benefit from increased retention rates, improved morale, increased organizational commitment and job satisfaction, accelerated leadership development, better succession planning, reduced stress, stronger and more cohesive teams, and heightened individual and organizational learning. Zachary further argues that mentoring has evolved over time as the practice moved from a product-oriented model characterized by a mere transfer of knowledge to a process-oriented relationship involving knowledge acquisition, application, and critical reflection. It doesn't matter if the organization is small or large, mentorship is important to success. Maxwell identifies five factors that lead to issues as to why mentoring doesn't always work. Insecurity is one of these factors. Lack of confidence is a major hindrance in reaching one's potential. If we could find the way to increase self-esteem, self-confidence, belief in oneself, and self-assurance in our peers, in our students, and help them find the tools they need to reach their potential, I really strongly believe we'd make a major impact on the personal and professional development and success of others. Ego is another factor that hinders uh, mentorship. As Maxwell argues, some people's egos are so big, they consistently have to be the center of all attention. They do not exist to help others reach their potential. Another factor is the inability to discern people's success seeds. Not everyone is in tune with their ability to reach their success. Maxwell calls it the seed of success. Not only does the mentee need to be able to know what the seed of success is, the mentor must be able to discern the seed in the mentee and tend to it in the relationship. The wrong concept of success is another factor. Not everyone has the same interpretation of what success is, that is knowing what your purpose is, growing to reach your maximum potential, and sowing the seeds to benefit others. Success is not always about acquiring things such as resources. Lack of training is the fifth factor. None of us were trained to be mentors. It's not part of what we learn in our academic programs, and so we may not always know how to navigate the mentor-mentee relationship. Now let's discuss mentorship in academia. As we know too well, academia has a fairly large selfish component. We select topics we want to research, we select our research collaborators, we select the students we supervise, we select what agencies to target for research funding, in some cases, we may even select or play a big role in choosing the courses we teach and to a certain extent when we teach them. I truly believe we have wonderful positions where we are in the driver's seat for many of the elements of our work. We are in privileged positions. In fact, we are in great positions to help our students, to guide their education, and to a certain extent, their career path. We have the power to impact our students and our peers every day, whether they be undergraduate students, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, and or our peers. We have such a great opportunity to be transformative mentors. As an important note, even though we have a privileged position in our work, I do want to underscore the fact that as professors, we do have a lot of pressures to secure research grants, to publish, to disseminate our research findings to the public, to keep abreast of the new developments in our fields for our research and for our teaching, 
to teach large courses, to interact with numerous students, to evaluate them, and to respond to the demands of accreditation bodies and regulatory agencies for specific skills and competencies for our students, and that's just to name a few. These challenges are time consuming, require a lot of effort and perseverance, and are well beyond the typical nine to five, Monday to Friday positions. Universities are a great starting point for mentor-mentee relationships. Several skills and competencies are introduced in the university setting that will need to be attended to and developed over time. In our promotional material to highlight the value of a higher education, the University of Ottawa, and I'm sure many other universities, including the University of Waterloo, showcase the skills and competencies students will acquire above and beyond their university degree. Many of the elements along this wheel are wonderful competencies we would love for all of our students to master. These competencies can be honed through mentor-mentee relationships. Even though they may be introduced in higher education settings, so many of these competencies will be refined and enhanced along a mentee's career and the guidance and assistance of mentors. We all want our students to succeed and these competencies are most certainly key attributes of, success, of successful individuals and leaders. The Department of Employment and Social Development Canada produced its own wheel of skills required for success. Perhaps not as elaborate as the previous slide, but still important skills required for today's work environment. And like the previous slide, many of these skills can be perfected through the mentor-mentee relationship. Returning to the context of universities, we know that in recent months, our students and us have faced a number of issues in their lives, in their studies, and in their work. I'm referring, of course, to the impact of the pandemic and its variants in all facets of our lives. Issues also include our increasing concerns and awareness of the importance of mental health and wellness, the Me Too movement and the need for a respectful workplace environment, issues of racism and increasing concerns about the lack of and or limited equity, diversity, inclusion and access in many aspects of society, including our universities. It also includes, to a certain extent, our seemingly indifference about our individual and collective impact on the environment. As well, issues surrounding science bashing and the proliferation of fake news and validation of these fake news throughout social media, and in some cases, even our traditional media sources. Conspiracy theorists and their followers are being validated as they reject evidence founded in science and in many cases reject the very scientists who have produced this knowledge. Now we all know that mentoring cannot solve all issues in our society, but I sincerely think that if we can have a positive impact on one individual more, we set a train in motion where mentees will become mentors and continue the positive impact on personal and professional development of others. Carmel and Paul argue that if less experienced academics are to be successful in academia, and if higher education institutions are to be transformative in what they do, mentoring is a crucial undertaking. They go on to explain that experienced academics need to see mentoring as part of their professional responsibility and should make themselves available to mentor others, even in the absence of a system or structure for mentoring. Their findings include new opportunities related to career advancement, expanded thinking, scholarly confidence, facilitation of a collaborative culture, and the importance of goal setting in academia. Could mentoring be considered as part of the activities responsibilities of faculty members like knowledge translation, mobilization and dissemination. As these activities are becoming a requirement of Tri-Council funding, 
They're also becoming part of our faculty members' collective agreements. These activities are now integrated in what we do and how we give back to our research participants, to our communities, and to society in general. Now, we're trained to be researchers, but we're not necessarily trained to be mentors. Not all faculty members have the ability to mentor people. Not all of them have the necessary people skills or the compassion to help our students develop into becoming contributing members of academia, as well as of society. And that's where the village analogy comes back into the picture. Since students are exposed to numerous professors, scholars, teachers along their path to graduation, could we ensure that they are exposed to great role models and to positive leadership models? Let me share what the leader of my interdisciplinary School of Health Sciences, Professor Karen Phillips, organizes with the presidents of her two graduate student associations. During the academic year, they organize a monthly seminar slash webinar series with leaders of health in Canada. With our virtual existence during the past 20 months, the webinar model has allowed them to access so many leaders from across the world. Members of the World Health Organization, leaders of the federal, provincial, and local public health agencies, scholars in universities across the globe, health professionals making a difference in their communities, just to name a few. I think this initiative exposes our students to a range of different efforts and leaders, different personalities, and different ways they have influenced health and healthcare through practice and or research. Their stories are often inspirational and they showcase their generosity with their time and their positive impact on society. Through this initiative, they are exposing our students to role models and leaders in their field. I suspect the Hallman Lecture Series plays a similar role at the University of Waterloo's Faculty of Health. Now I want to come back to the two-way relationship I brought up in my introduction. Must there always be an overt mentor or mentors, mentee team for mentorship to take place? Or can we be mentors to individuals without being in this two-way relationship? That is without our knowledge of the mentor role we occupy. I think we set or have the potential to set an example to hundreds of students we teach every year, not to mention the students we supervise more directly in senior undergraduate studies and in graduate studies. And setting an example is an important part of any mentoring relationship. We consider student supervision as part of our teaching workloads. Why not make sure we provide professors with training opportunities to enhance the student experience, like workshops on how to mentor and activities to assist professors in maximizing the positive professor-student encounters, to enhance communication, to provide the tools to deliver honest and direct feedback, and to increase what Cole calls the three A's of mentorship, being available, being active listeners, and analysis. And if students in the virtual room today, please don't hesitate to tell your professors who, had have, who has had an impact on your development as an individual and or an impact in your professional development. It's important for them to know, if we can be mentors without our knowledge, imagine how we could become more conscientious about the impact we have on our students when we receive feedback, regardless whether it's positive, not so positive, or constructive. Understanding that our interactions may not always be positive, it's also important to give honest feedback and to be integral in our interactions. When I interact with students in my current position, I always ask them how they're doing, how they like their program of study. I ask them about their future plans as well. And when they tell me something great about a professor in my faculty, I usually make a point of emailing the professors and telling them the impact they have had on the student. The professor's response, of course, are favorable and sometimes they seem to be genuinely surprised. 
I think it's as important to let people know when they are not meeting standards in their work as it is when they are doing a great job. We tend to let people know when they are not doing their job, we're not always good about letting people know that they're doing well and or exceeding expectations. Feedback is an important aspect in the mentoring relationship. As Akers notes, in an open and trustworthy relationship, both the mentor and the mentee are responsible for providing feedback. Feedback is about evaluation and goal setting. In an article focusing on feedback to millennials, Moore and Burney write, feedback should be on the spot and if possible in the moment. One should balance the positive and negative feedback, describe the problem specifically, involve the mentee in the solution, and establish follow-up expectations. Of course, the SMART framework for feedback is also an important guide. That is specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-based. Giving feedback is an important strategy to improve your skills and competencies, to improve your work and your relationship with others. The feedback is important for both mentees and mentors. We learn a lot from people we respect and the people who are part of our lives, whether it's in our work setting, our education setting, even our social setting. Yet, I also believe we learn a lot from challenging experiences. Let me provide two examples that shape behavior as a professor. The first example was my experience as an undergraduate student quite a few years ago. Our professors always had office hours posted on the course outline and on their doors. But when you went to their offices to see them, their door was closed, even though it was during their office hours. I had such dread knocking on the door. Was I disturbing them? Should I really be there? Should I knock on the door? Was there another student meeting with the professor? Should I come back? It seems ridiculous now but I really needed courage to knock on the door. Why were most professors' doors closed, even during office hours? Early in my career, I decided that I never wanted a student to feel like I did when I was an undergraduate student. So as a professor, if I was in my office and wasn't in a meeting, my door was always my second experience came as a new faculty member who hadn't quite finished her PhD when she was hired at a different university. So I spent a lot of time at work beyond regular office hours to progress on my dissertation. Several other graduate students were around and always came and talked to me. Kathy Babiak in the audience was one of those students. After all, my door was always open. They asked for feedback. Could I read this chapter? What did I think about this and that? I really enjoyed meeting with the graduate students. I had a chance to see what the students wanted or needed to progress and how I could support them without having the official responsibility of supervising them. As a junior professor, I knew what worked for me to help my learning. And in my actor interactions with the students, I had a sense of what they needed and how I could help them. And so it was my introduction to how to supervise future graduate students and also how not to supervise graduate students while understanding the importance to be self-aware and to appreciate that what works for one person may not work for another. As another lesson, it was important to me as a new professor to surround myself with people who were positive, supportive, cared about the students, and cared about the quality of their work and the impact of this work. It worked out to be a great strategy. I suspect that many of you had positive role models growing up in academia, and you are probably great role models to your students and peers. I say this because I like what I see in terms of the research and the increasing diversity in the curricula of our academic programs. I'm reassured to see the great seasoned professors and emerging professors in our field of health, sport, and leisure studies. I'm including the University of Waterloo professors in the audience in there. 
we in health, sport, and leisure faculty members are such in great hands. Scholarship in our fields has evolved to now include our analysis of more complex, dynamic, coordinated, and collaborative research approaches, and involving our research participants as decision makers and active participants in our research process. Interdisciplinarity and interprofessionalism are now often part of researchers' work. Topics related to innovation, entrepreneurship, organizational learning, and artificial intelligence to best practices in health, sport, and leisure studies are now central. We also have an increasing occurrence of research addressing social justice, social activism, social responsibility, and sustainability. Mental health, wellness, concepts of happiness and their impact on health, the importance of active living, of spending time outdoors, of healthy eating are all central to our well being. Elements of EDI and access and disparities in health, sport, and leisure, including Indigenous health, sport, and leisure research, have taken on a greater level of importance in our work. And our students are actively engaged in these research topics and genuinely involved in making a difference in multiple settings. As well, knowledge mobilization is integrated in what we do. These recent developments have likely taken place in a context of support and mentorship. I believe mentorship can create an environment that is conducive to learning, to sharing, to operate in a respectful work setting in the present and in the future. Mentorship can help our colleagues thrive in a positive and supportive work environment and ensure long-term impact in personal and professional development. Let's remember that at some point, each of us entered as a new member of this community, needing guidance on everything from technical skills to social media, to navigating the complexities of the organization. Mentorship is about helping others. In the role of mentor, it is important to understand that how we treat someone is a reflection of us, and it's important to be aware and to reflect on how our actions have an impact on others as official or unofficial mentors. As mentees, uh, embrace the notion that many members of the village can help you in your development. And as mentors, again, officially or unofficially, Never underestimate the impact you may have on others. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thibault. That was uh, an excellent talk. I'm going to moderate the question um, period. So I look forward to hearing some questions that kind of extend the talk or perhaps challenge some ideas. But I will uh, open it up for applause before I do that. So thank you very much. Thanks, Ryan. Can't hear everyone else's, but I'll, uh, I'll clap for them. Thank you. Um, okay, and if you if you want to identify something in the chat, I'm ha happy to read that if that's useful, but um, feel free to put your hand up and I'll do my best to see, or if I'm not seeing you, just, you know, pipe in. Don't be shy. I'd be happy to start. Go ahead, Steve. That was great, Lucy. Thank you so much. And it's so nice to see you virtually. And uh, I'm, I'm not surprised at all that, that you're speaking on a topic like this. You, you just exude <laughs> that kind of positivity as a mentor. And uh, I've, whenever we've interacted, I've always appreciated that. Um, now, I, and uh, just as a quick bizarre aside, um, the beauty of working at home is I get to let the plumber in <laughs> while I'm in the middle of a conference call. So if you said what I'm about to ask you, please forgive me. <laughs> um, and, and my plumbing is good now, <laughs> which is also That's good. good. That's um, good. What, what I find really fascinating about, oh, <laughs> thank, thank you, Elizabeth. What I find really fascinating about mentoring, and, and this is why I'm, I'm not sure if maybe you covered it or not, so I don't wanna be uh, overly repetitive, is um, 
the formal versus informal aspect of it. And you're, you're talking about, you know, programs and training, it, which I totally get. And, and I think that we, we would all benefit from that. But there's also more the informal aspect of mentorship. And, and sort of at the core of it is it has a lot to do with relationships. And, and our, our jobs, in a way, are, are very relational. And the quality of those relationships bring joy to our lives and, and our work. Um, and over the years, when, and just, just sort of as a quick aside, I love that you said there's multiple people involved here. So we may not necessarily have one mentor. We may have multiple mentors, maybe that, that assess or, or, or speak to different aspects of our careers and our career development. Um, so I'm just curious about that aspect. You know, is mentoring something that we can and should be formalizing or should we just kind of be, you know, em embracing and... And, uh, you know, nurturing and acknowledging the, the informal aspects of mentorship, like the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up and maybe in a slightly awkward, confused way is sometimes things are just kind of natural and they just happen because of your personality and your fit with another person. And you can't always necessarily train, train that. You know, and sometimes with mentorship, people try to match people up and it, I've never found that that works. <laughs> it, those relationships are things that that seem to happen more and more naturally and with people that you gravitate to. Um, could you maybe speak speak to that a little, or maybe share your thoughts on that? Yeah, I actually totally agree. Uh, I, I think there's, uh, you know, uh, an aspect of mentorship that's very organic. It happens because you know, our work is relational and, and because we click with other individuals. And, uh, and, and so I, I totally think that there's an informal aspect to mentorship that's important. And I, I think as individuals and as professors, we need to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, what we say and what we do might actually get, you know, picked up or, or be interpreted and, and, and uh, assumed or, or uh, undertaken by our, our colleagues, our peers, our students. Uh, so, I, so I think, you know, the, the aspect of, uh, you know, how we act might actually find itself in how uh, our students act in the future, our graduate students and so on. So if we have a kind of a positive outlook on, on our work and, and, and if we're, you know, giving and we're, um, we're collaborative and we help, uh, and we're compassionate and so on, I think that uh, that certainly makes a difference. Now, I, I also think that there's a value in having a kind of official mentorship programs in organizations. Um, and sometimes, and I, you know, I, I, I came into my position in, in 2018, I really didn't know anything about being a dean. Um, and, and when I came into the University of Ottawa, I was actually coming you know, from another institution. I had started my career at the University of Ottawa, but I, I'd been away for 24 years. And so when I came in, um, the, the provost, no fault of his, it's, it's a new provost now, uh, no fault of his, but uh, I, I wish now that he would have said, hey, Lucy, I, I, you know, I'm going to assign another dean to you just kind of help out if you have any questions, if you, you know, what systems are in place at the University of Ottawa, how does this work, the culture and so on. So just to kind of team me with someone. So it may not have been like an official mentorship mm -hmm. program, but I think it would have helped. And I think uh, organizations have a part to play in developing uh, some mechanisms to allow for that to happen. Now, I have to say, you know, we, it's kind of a new system where now deans coming in, particularly deans coming from another institution, uh, are now matched with a seasoned dean uh, in order to, to allow for that to happen. So there's been progress in that respect, and I think that that's helpful. I also, uh, you know, I sort of, I, the, one of my diagrams was the PGA of Alberta. And really, when you look at it, it's like, okay, you know, if you want to be a mentor, fill out a form. If you're a mentee and, and want a mentor, fill out a form and, and we'll match you. And, you know, that might work in a kind of a lottery type of system. But I think for the most part, there really has to be a connection. There has to be respect. Uh, between the two individuals for, for a, a solid mentor-mentee relationship to happen. 
Um, and so I, I think in our positions, we're probably more unofficial mentors than we, than we know, than we think, mm -hmm. uh, just because we interact with so many students. And I remember a story, this was when I was kind of learning to be, uh, I was kind of doing my, my courses to become a Red Cross water instructor, you know, sort of swimming lessons kind of thing. And the instructor told us, uh, the sort of the master instructor told us on the first day that we should always steal selectively. And I thought, wow, what a thing to say. But what she meant was like, the good ideas and the, the behaviors of people you respect and, and what seems to work for you and, and you see in others, steal, you know, take it as your ideas and take it on as your behaviors. And I, I kind of, you know, the fact that I still remember that when that was like way beyond before my undergraduate studies, even, um, you know, kind of always stuck with me. Like if, if you like what someone does, like how someone uh, deals with a problem or, or interacts with individuals, take on, you know, assume that, assume that behavior or develop that behavior. Well, anyway, I'm, I'm going to steal, it. I'm going to steal from you, Lucy, then. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you very Perfect. much. Permission granted. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Steve, for kicking us off. Um, I think Lorena is up next and then Shannon. Oh, Shannon. Hey, Lorena, how's it going? Good. How are you? It's good. nice to hear from you. I miss this. I really yeah. miss this, having these interactions. Um, and I was realizing as you were answering this that I hope that this question does not get misinterpreted. Um, and I'm not saying that you are an imposter. However, some oh. of us in a mentor position sometimes feel like we have the imposter syndrome of like, why is someone coming to us? What do we know about this? How do we feel confident with that? How do you react to that? And again, I'm not saying you have the imposter no, syndrome, no. but rather, you know, there, I think there are times when this happens. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I, I still occasionally, maybe less now, but I, I felt like an imposter for probably the first two years of my work as, as dean. I kind of like, what the, what the hell am I doing here kind of thing. And um uh, anyways, uh, you know, I'm still, I'm still, still learning. And I think there's, uh, you know, the, the imposter, uh, the imposter syndrome, that might be more of a, a gendered uh, type of syndrome, unfortunately, but I also think it says something about us to feel uh, as an imposter. Uh, and it doesn't mean that we lack self-confidence that we lack, but we kind of question, what are we doing here? What's our contribution? And, and I think those are good questions to have to, to kind of, you know, like to make sure that you, you uh, tie in place, you, you make sure that you take the space that you need to, to have the influence, to contribute, to help, to assist, and so on. So I, um, yeah, like I think, uh, and, and maybe others can pipe in in terms of, of uh, the imposter syndrome, but I, I, I think, we, we don't always know what the mentees are looking for. And, and we don't also all, always know what the mentees are lacking. Um, and sometimes, you know, by being genuine and integral and, and true to yourself, uh, you know, that sets an example, even though somebody may not like you as an individual, they may respect you, they may respect your work, they may respect the contributions you've made. And so I don't think we need to feel as the imposter syndrome, uh, you know, or, or, or to feel as a as an imposter, but I think it's, uh, you know, it's kind of, you know, for me, it's sort of the balances and the check to kind of make sure that you kind of stay, you know, stay abreast of the latest developments that you kind of make sure that you know your files and you uh, that you can best serve in the position that you are in, whether it's professor, whether it's mentor, whether it's mentee, and, and so on. So I don't know if I answered that question, but once again, I may have rambled. Great, thank you. Um, Shannon Kerwin has a question in the chat. Um, I'm okay. happy to read it unless she wants to jump on. Go ahead, Shannon. I can jump on. I didn't yep. have my microphone, and so I wasn't going to speak high to see. <laughs> but I ran and grabbed my microphone. Good. How are you? Good, good. Well, thank you. Um, as always, you are inspiring. Um, my question is, um, 
So you mentioned the fake news piece, and I see that a lot now um, in terms of what guides um, some individuals' um, understanding. So as a mentor, do you have any strategies for pushing, and I say pushing, sharing, guiding mentees towards ways to question that? So um, it's a, an interesting relationship when you're working with a mentee and maybe trying to guide them in a certain direction. So how, how do you go about doing that? I would love to know. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. And, um, you know, sort of, I know mentees are, uh, you know, and the sort of the younger, you know, the younger mentees are, are, you know, grew up more with social media than we did. Well, we, I did, sorry. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're much younger than I am. Um, and so sometimes I, I, I feel a little sort of out of touch with respect to, you know, social media and trying to dispel uh, facts, you know, or fake news, not dispel facts, uh, but kind of make sure that, uh, that our students question, what do you, you know, if you read it somewhere, it doesn't mean it's true. You know, if you read it on social media, uh, it doesn't uh, validate it. And, uh, and just kind of, you know, what are your sources? Question, questioning the sources uh, for the students. But, you know, increasingly, I, I find out, especially sort of, you know, again, that sort of generational divide, but our, our students may be relying extensively, you know, for their news, extensively on social media. Does anybody read a newspaper? And, and I don't mean the, the print version because we hardly can find those anymore. But do they go online and do they read the CBC news? Do they, you know, read uh, the Globe and Mail uh, online? Do they, you know, sort of uh, uh, acquire their news from reliable sources? And I think as, as professors, I think as, as mentors, we kind of have to encourage to make sure that your sources are from credible places. Um, I'm not sure that that really answers the you know answers your question, but certainly the you know it's sometimes it's kind of difficult to find out what the you know what's fake and what's not fake, and and we know sometimes in the report of of research that a finding uh, one you know. Uh, you know, two years ago is now being refuted in a study that's, uh, that's coming up now. And, and to kind of put things in perspective that we, there is a, a process of evolution in our, in our knowledge and um, in, in producing this knowledge and we have more sophisticated techniques and, and are able to look at, you know, the type of, um, of phenomenon and study that phenomenon from multiple perspectives. And, and not related to fake news, but if we look at, you know, the first, uh, you know, issues of, of the Journal of Sport Management, um, for those of you in sport management, or if you go back, you know, 20 years or 30 years into uh, a journal and look at the articles and look at the type of research that was done and look at the research that's being done now and, and how much more complex um, and dynamic and, and uh, you know, collaborative the research is. Uh, and I, I think, you know, we have to not only encourage our students to read credible sources of news, but also uh, to read, uh, uh, you know, journals and uh, to be appraised of the research that's being done uh, in our fields. And, and, you know, increasingly with knowledge translation and knowledge mobilization, you know, we have um, uh, made uh, research more accessible to our, uh, to our students and, and to the public in general. And I think that's also another source that we have to uh, uh, send our students or make sure our students are aware of. Great, thank, thank you. you. Um, Haley Baxter, you're up next, and then uh, Kathy Babiak. Hi, Lucy, thank you so much for your talk today. Um, so my question is just, I know on the call, you've supervised and uh, mentored a lot of faculty and possibly students on this call. Um, so as a mentor, what are or were some of the characteristics that you appreciated most in your mentees? Oh, wow. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, well, I, you know, ultimately, uh, as a mentee, it's the willingness uh, you know, being open, uh, open to the feedback, open to uh, 
you know, asking questions and, and, you know, sort of the, you know, it's more about maybe in that case, the way relationship that, that it's a discussion, that it's a, an ongoing um, dialogue between the mentor and the mentee, but there has to be like the mentee has to be receptive. And, and I would say that's probably the number one uh, key attribute uh, of a mentee. If, if you don't want to be mentored, if you don't need help, you know how sometimes you, you have students who know it all and uh, you can't, you know, teach them anything or you can't, you know, they, they've, ex, you know, they have a better example. If, you know, you tell them something, I think if you're not willing to, to learn from others, then you, you shouldn't be a mentee and you're probably not a mentee. So, so I think receptivity would probably be key as a, as, a, as, as an attribute uh, to a mentee. So, you know, willingness to accept the feedback, um, willingness to, to do the hard work of, of trying to change if change is needed and, and you know, willingness to, to grow, you know, and, and you know, to, to kind of work, build up on, on the strengths that you have, but also uh, try to deal with the, with the weaknesses. And again, you know, we might have these relationships with people without necessarily calling it a mentee and a mentor, but it happens. And I think it happens as graduate, you know, as the relationship between a supervisor and a graduate student. It doesn't always work as a mentor-mentee type of relationship, but it should technically, you know, your, your supervisors are, are you, you spend so much time with the supervisor and you get so much uh, feedback from the supervisor that, you know, it would be ideal for the supervisor to be one of the mentors to the students. Great. So. Dr. Babiak, you're up next. Hello, everyone. Nice to see everyone today. And Lucy, thank you for an amazing talk and for being an amazing mentor throughout my career. So um, I had a question uh, as, you know, I've been part of committees and evaluations that I've been seeing a lot, a lot more interest um, and relevance of the role of mentorship being considered in, um, you know, faculty hiring decisions, annual reviews, and promotion reviews, and so on. So I'm kind of curious as to how you see it, even as a dean and administrator, or in your role, previous roles, uh, your leadership roles. Um, how do you, how would you advise um, evaluation committees to interpret and understand what successful mentorship means? And also on the flip side for us or, or students or new faculty members, how can they convey or um, communicate the success of their mentorship? Yeah, great, great question. Especially, you know, so partly, and I mentioned it a bit in the talk, you know, how uh, you know, mentorship is not really officially part of our work, but I think it should be. Um, and I, I kind of, you know, like I, I sometimes see in terms of the documents that people submit, for example, in the annual report. So faculty members typically submit the annual report. And I see, you know, faculty members and, and perhaps kind of it's a new and perhaps it should be uh, introduced as a way to operate. But to actually showcase this student got a Shirk doctoral fellowship. This student is first author on, on a publication from, you know, or a single publication, single authored uh, publication. Uh, so, so I see it in, in some professors essentially identifying their, their trainees or their mentees uh, and the success of their mentees. And, and not that they're taking credit necessarily for that work, but they're certainly associating their supervision of the student and, and perhaps their mentorship of the student in their uh, annual reports. And, and perhaps that should be becoming uh, an item when we submit for, for promotion, for tenure, um, because we always ask, you know, like how many students have you supervised? Um, and, and maybe we should have a, a mentor mentee sort of section that highlights the success of our trainees and, and the impact that we have. And of course there's, you know, we have impact we don't even know because the students don't necessarily tell us because it's not 
necessarily in a in a student um, professor relationship as a supervision as graduate students, but but you know perhaps as I, I you know in my uh, at the University of Ottawa we just uh, renegotiated collective agreement and knowledge translation knowledge mobilization is now an item you know that uh, when you go up for promotion and tenure it's now part of uh, an expectation that you'll showcase how you do knowledge translation and, and knowledge mobilization and dissemination of your research findings. So I'm kind of hopeful that maybe this needs to take place. And I think, you know, the University of Ottawa is increasingly talking about the need uh, for mentorship. And, and we do it um, in our academic office for our students. So we have uh, fourth year students um, selected specifically because they are great students they're compassionate, they want to do this, they're trained, and uh, they become mentors for the, the first uh, and second year students. And that kind of works out well. And if we, if the institution can create mechanisms and structures in place to allow this to happen, then why not do it uh, beyond, uh, you know, a faculty member writing in their CV or writing in their application that they're, they've supervised X number of, of PhD students and X number of, of master's students, why not have a narrative that provides uh, the faculty member with the opportunity to showcase, uh, you know, sort of the impact, right? Like the generational, you know, I was a supervisor, here's a student, and this, you know, future faculty member or future uh, professional will have an impact because you had an impact on that person. So, so I don't know that we're there yet, but, uh, but I, I, I'm starting to see it in the, certainly in the annual reports. And it's, it's actually, it's kind of nice to see. And I think for faculty members to, you know, I, I, I wanna say quantify, but also qualify uh, the type of mentorship is, uh, is important, so. I like, I like that. I like that. Um, that's really um, interesting because I think a lot of people are, like you said, are a bit shy to take, seem like they're taking credit for their student success. So there's got to be some way that we can articulate it without that creating that uh, impression. So mm -hmm. uh, that, that was really um, helpful. Um, Dr. Harmon is up next. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, hi, Lucy. Thanks hi, how's it going? Thanks. Good. Um, I think you actually started to allude to it a bit in your response to Kathy, but you know, the idea that it takes a village, there's lots of us, how can we go about creating a culture um, that encourages mentorship? Yeah, uh, good one. Uh, so, so I think, uh, you know, we have some work to do sort of in terms of, uh, uh, of a leadership within, within departments, within schools, within units, but also within, you know, faculties and within central admin. Um, and, um, you know, I don't, I don't know if, if um, you know, different universities have, have different structures in place. We do have, uh, you know, a, a center that kind of helps students. Uh, so it's a, a kind of a support service system for, for students. Uh, and we also have a center that we call a center for academic leadership. And in that center, we have, you know, one person whose job it is, and, and she works with other people on campus with other faculty members, but um, she essentially helps mentor, uh, helps uh, assist faculty members, particularly new faculty members, in developing their profile and their applications, especially for tenure and promotion. Um, you know, she helps uh, faculty members with, uh, you know, assistance with writing. She, she has seminars and workshops. Uh, where faculty members are assisted in the different types of work that they do. So the writing one is kind of like almost a, a, a bit of a short retreat. And, you know, you leave your cell phone at the door, you're kind of in a room, I, I don't know how she does it virtually now, but you're kind of, you know, devoting an afternoon or devoting the whole day to writing, to progressing into academic publications or uh, or scholarship. Uh, and so like, I think there's ways for us to structure uh, situations where as new faculty members, we can be mentored, we can be assisted and helped. 
Um, and I actually just communicated uh, with the person who's in charge of the Center for Academic Leadership um, uh, this morning because someone was asking me, you know, how can new faculty members uh, navigate how to develop a, an application form for a sabbatical? And I thought, hmm, okay, like we take it for granted. Here's the form, you fill it out, you submit it, but, but how do you kind of capture what you really want to do and, and, and the impact that what you're going to do in your sabbatical and, and, uh, and speak to that in the application. So, so I think there's mechanisms that, you know, we're starting to see, but I also think that, you know, as, as university, we have, we have to look at uh, putting in measures to, and not to force it, you don't, you know, fill out a form if you want a mentor and fill out a form if you want a mentee and then match people. I, like, I don't think that's going to work, but I think if there is mechanisms in place where people can go for assistance, for help, for, um, uh, you know, for, for mentorship, and then, uh, you know, sometimes being in group uh, with the person from the Center of Academic Leadership, for example, and the faculty members she works with in order to, uh, to support the new faculty members. I think that's, uh, you know, there's certainly ways to, to do it. And I know, uh, and, and maybe it happened for you when you started a new, as a, as a new faculty member, like is there an orientation session uh, and, and what's presented at the orientation session? You know, it's often kind of like a recipe. Okay, let's hear from the provo. Uh, what does a provo do in a university? Then let's find out uh, from a dean and what's expected from a faculty member uh, as a dean, what will you have to do? And, you know, we can have kind of the, the logical stuff that you have to do as a faculty member, but I think there's also opportunities to say, what, what do you need as a new faculty member? And then to develop, um, to make sure that we fulfill those needs as, as an institution. And I, I think the Center for Academic Leadership is, is meant to do that, but doesn't always work out that way, but uh, but I think uh, we also need to let people know, you know, this, this you know, as a, as a new dean, I sort of told my provo, hey, that would have been really helpful for me to be matched to a seasoned dean, and so, you know, now it's being done uh, for the new dean of, of business at at the university. So so there's also an opportunity, I think, for us to say what what we didn't get when we started and what we need. And to ask our students, what is it that you need, whether it's grad students or undergraduate students, what do you need? What, what was your experience as a first year student? And, and how did we fail um, you know, uh, as a university or how did we fail as a program? Like, so I think those, those items are, are also important. Thanks. Um, I'm gonna take an opportunity to ask a question. I think it sort of builds off Alana's question is, when we were in person, um, one of the forms of mentorship I'd see kind of every day just walking around is peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. And yeah. I thought that was really powerful. Certainly we have great advisors in our department and a lot of people willing to be informal mentors, uh, even people not on committees. But I see that peer-to-peer -peer mentorship literally every day, uh, pretty much all day. Would you share some thoughts about peer-to-peer -peer mentorship and how that fits in with your analogy of it takes a village? Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. And actually, I think you're right. And I think being in kind of a virtual um, situation and, and the fact that we're now, uh, you know, meeting after meeting and we get to a situation in a, in a Zoom call or a team meeting. You know how when you came into a meeting before in person, everybody, hey, how's it going? Whoa, what, you know, it's raining outside. Well, it's kind of getting cold. And, you know, what's news? And so you get the opportunity to exchange. Now in a Zoom call, everybody's silent until the meeting starts. And so there's no interaction. There's no, uh, you know, kind of how's it going? Uh, so there's no informal aspect. So I, I think you're right. Peer to peer is important. And, uh, you know, discussions about sharing, you know, like you just, you know, wrote an application for Shirk. You've got a new faculty member coming in. Hey, I want to write a Shirk application. Um, hey, you know, do you want to see what I wrote in my Shirk app? Ah, oh, that would be helpful. 
And it's just kind of a, a way to share resources. And, you know, we had a discussion earlier this week about uh, sharing slides, like sharing, a, you know, a course that you've developed and sharing this course and not just the, the course outline, not just the syllabus, but, but sharing the whole thing. And I know, you know, there's all these things about intellectual property, but if someone is teaching the course that you taught for several years, I always thought, you know what, if you gave me uh, your slides, if you gave me your course, I, I, it would be extremely helpful to me. I wouldn't be able to take your slides and show up to class and, and click on your slides and speak to the slides. I, that's just not what I do. But kind of saying, hey, you're teaching this course that I used to teach. Hey, you know, would you like my slides? Like, I think that's kind of a peer to peer. Would, would that be helpful? Or do you want to sit down? Do you want to talk about it? Uh, you know, do you have ideas? I'm thinking of changing this and so on. So absolutely peer to peer um, can work wonderfully. And I think, you know, we probably, you know, with open doors and, uh, and, and the ability to be willing to share, I think is important in academia. And, you know, sometimes you have like this territorial aspect of, you know, no, this is my course. And, and we always tell people, you know, no, it's the course and the program, you don't own it. Um, but I think, uh, you know, sharing resources and, and, and going to faculty members and saying, hey, you know, I have this student in my class, uh, you know, I sort of have issues with communication or, or, you know, receptivity and so on. Like, do you, do you have, do you have tools? Do you have uh, advice to give me? And not, not to sort of single out the student. You don't even have to tell who the student is, but just to, to kind of get feedback on going to seasoned professors and finding out what works or what doesn't work. Uh, and sometimes like I find people want to be listened to or people want to be heard um and i i think you know i sort of find out that there's always two sides to a story and so you kind of talk to someone and then you get their perception and then you talk to the other person who's involved in the similar situation and you have a totally different take and i think sometimes you're just kind of hearing like you know sort of listening to to the student or listening to, um, to the faculty member. And, and, and sometimes that's all they need just to be heard. And, and I think that's extremely important. And it's, you know, like the collegiality of a unit, of a department uh, is extremely important. And, and when that doesn't exist, you know, when you're not happy at work, like when you don't respect your colleagues or when you don't get along, it, it's, I, I think it drains uh, it drains you as an individual and you're probably less receptive to helping others and, and to be helped. Uh, and so I think your work environment is, is extremely important. And so the village notion, again, is, is, you know, it's not just you might get along really well with a person with, you know, one faculty member in the department, but the department works because all of the members are, are working and, and should be you know, rowing in the same direction, that is, you know, uh, rowing the achieve, you know, what's the goal, where are you rowing to, and, and it's for the success of our students. And I think it's kind of always important to keep that in mind, even in an environment where we might be surrounded by people with egos and, um, and this sense of entitlement, you know, what's, what's, you know, not what's in it for me, but how do I contribute to the goals of, of, uh, of success for the students? Graduation, getting a job, publications, um, and getting faculty positions and so on, so. Thank you, that, yeah, that, those are excellent uh, comments. And I would just add really briefly, like I'm really proud of our, our graduate students because they offer each other a lot of support and a lot of mentorship there. Um, so that, that's another uh, great source, which is all part of that whole village um, analogy. So that's really helpful. Are there any other um, questions before I turn it back over to Troy? Okay, um, Troy, are you still, are you available? 
Yep. Thank you, okay. Ryan. I appreciate your uh, moderate, moderating. Thank you. Um, Dr. Uh, Thibault, just wanted to thank you for your career contributions to the study of leisure, to your influence on leisure scholarship at the University of Waterloo, and for your international contributions to leisure studies and sport management. At this time, we would normally present you with a plaque to commemorate your visit to the University of Waterloo and get a photo. But as I understand it, the plaque is currently in transit. Nevertheless, we would like to get a screenshot. So Dr. Thibault, we welcome you to give us your best pose so that we can get a pic now. How's that sound? Sophia, are you, Sophia, are you ready? <laughs> I am. So if anyone else would like to be included in the picture, feel, please yeah. feel free to throw on your camera so we can get a nice group photo of all of us. That's that's a good idea. And and Troy, can I ask if uh, yeah. you know when the chat when the uh, when the call ends, I'll kind of lose access to the chat. If uh, if it's possible to kind of keep access, if you save the chat and and if you're willing to share it, I didn't have a chance to read while I'm. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. I can actually uh, we, copy and paste that to you. Perfect. Okay, <laughs> perfect. Thank you, Sandy. I'm not technically uh, proficient <laughs> at these things, so I'm glad Sandy responded. That's great. Excellent. Thanks, okay, Sandy. if everybody could turn their screen on, we'll get a nice group shot, and, and then we can say goodbye. Okay. <laughs> good smiles, everyone. <laughs> All right, uh, before I let everyone go, I would like to thank Sandy Heisey uh, for her assistance with this event and Lowell Williamson uh, for his technical support. So thanks to those two events don't happen like this without their support. So many thanks to both of them. Uh, to our audience, thank you for attending today's event. Go forth and be good mentors. All right, take care everyone, thank you. Thanks Troy, thanks again uh, for the award. I'm so well-deserved. Thanks, Lucy. Merci, merci. Thank you. Have All a great right. weekend, everyone. Great to you. see so many familiar faces. All right. Take care, everyone.